But the purpose of university is to find a suitable husband. Rose has already done that. Torture. Your mother's trying to fix you up with some divorcee. Uh. Why, you should be proud I'd rather live alone than crawl up behind some two-timing loser like Kenneth. He's begging on his damn knees and you letting him get away. Greetings, guest. Welcome to the patriarchy, where we explore cinema classics fueled by predictive Hollywood programming and unpack how our favorite characters in cinema got egg all over their faces. I am your commentator, Dom, and tonight we're unpacking the marriage centered well, I mom. I know the holidays can be stressful, but no man wants to marry a smoker. Who lies? There is a verse in Proverbs 22 6 that states, Train up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And when thinking about this topic, I can't help but wonder if this is the thought process of the marriage centered mom. And that's actually a rhetorical question. We all know that it is. This is, after all, how families, traditions, and overall culture is established. It's right here in this verse. Train up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Our quote-unquote guidelines in life are given to us by our elders and parents, showing the way to the young, passing along and instilling their traditions, their family values, and their culture into their young. And today, as we discuss the marriage-centered moms as seen in film, we'll see that in some of these examples, the daughters being pressured into these unfulfilling relationships and marriages almost always revolt. I want to share an excerpt from this book I've been reading titled Homecoming by Dr. Thema Bryant. And I just started the chapter on reparenting yourself. And I want us to keep this in mind as we analyze the behaviors of the characters in the films we discuss today. As adults, we recognize that parents are imperfect people and that they did the best that they could given their own capacity, wellness, mental health, knowledge, and resources. In some cases, they may have grown since they parented us, but the season of our childhood is gone. Reparenting yourself means recognizing what you lost or what you were not given as a child and beginning to give those things to yourself now. Later on in the text, Dr. Thema Bryant explains how sometimes our parents, although they may be present, they don't affirm us. And that's key. And some parents treat their children as simple outgrowths or extensions of themselves. Some also treat their children as burdens, servants, or as tools to gain a sense of power or worth. And that's actually the perfect lead-in to talk about Rose's mom from the Titanic. Do you want to see me working as a seamstress? See our fine things sold at auction. Our memories scattered to the winds. So I feel silly giving a rundown of the plot of the Titanic. It's like one of the most popular stories in history. And in the late 90s, this was the highest grossing film of all time in the entire world and held that title for over a decade. But for protocol, we are discussing the plot of the 1997 film directed by James Cameron starring Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio and the love story that unfolded on board the 1912 RMS Titanic before she sank to the bottom of the sea. So Rose's mom, Ruth, played by Frances Fisher, is basically a penniless widow who has arranged her daughter's engagement to Cal, played by Billy Zane. Now, Cal, Rose's fiancé, can be described as many things. He is pompous, pretentious, controlling, conniving, but most importantly, to Ruth at least, he is insanely wealthy as the heir to his father's Pittsburgh Steel fortune. So Ruth and Rose are a part of the aristocratic society, and Ruth will do anything to remain there, including pimping her daughter out so that they maintain their status in social class. And I used to think that this wasn't uncommon for that time period and that Rose's behavior to follow her heart was in fact much more avant-garde than her mom, Ruth, finding someone within their social class for her to marry. But actually, nearly a century earlier in 1813, Jane Austen's body of work and very beloved novels began to 
mold and shift the landscape in the realm of the meaning of marriages. Let's watch this School of Life clip for some context. Readers of Jane Austen's latest novel are on the edge of their seats as Fitzwilliam Darcy stumbles his way through a proposal to Elizabeth Bennet. His offer of marriage promises to fix all her problems. Not only is he handsome, but he's rich and Elizabeth's family, with four unmarried daughters to support, badly needs all the cash they can get. But Elizabeth says no. Darcy, for all his gifts, is also arrogant and a snob. Pride and prejudice may suggest women marry for money, but Elizabeth's actions reveal a new and subversive belief rapidly gaining currency in English society, that they should love the man they betrothed themselves to. It's an idea Austen supports strongly. Eleven years earlier, she had herself rejected a proposal of marriage, claiming anything is to be preferred or endured rather than marrying without affection. And this is Rose. She's coming of age in an era where she needs more than just someone who can provide for her and her family. She needs connection, genuine interest, and to be heard and regarded and affirmed. And she rejects Cal because he's arrogant, mean, belittling, and not just to Jack, who's Rose's love interest, but also to his future wife. My wife in practice, if not yet by law, so you will honor me. You will honor me the way a wife is required to honor her husband. Is this in any way unclear? No. Yet her mom is relentless in her marrying him for her benefit. And her benefit only, she doesn't care what Rose wants. She just doesn't want to be pushed down to the working class. And she tries to manipulate her daughter through force, mixed with a little bit of pity to maintain her standing in society. How can you put this on my shoulders? Why are you being so selfish? I'm being selfish. Ma, I am sick of you telling me how I should live my life. Mama, I'm 33 years old and I live alone. Mm. Yeah, tell me about it. So when I saw the request for this video topic, and by the way, thank you to everyone who provides ideas for content for this channel in the comments. I truly do appreciate it. But this is the first line that came to mind. He's a good man, Savannah. A good man. He's just in a bad situation right now, and he's trying to get out of it. If you don't know where this is from, Waiting to Exhale came out in 1995 and is based off the romance novel written by Terry McMillan. The film was directed by Forrest Whitaker and stars the late and great Whitney Houston alongside Angela Bassett, Layla Rashawn, and Loretta Devine. So the plot of the film follows four friends in Phoenix, Arizona who are all trying to navigate love in their 30s. So this is one of those films with multiple storylines. Each of the four women have their own battles, trials, and tribulations that they are dealing with in regards to their love life. But for this marriage-centered, male-centered moms episode, we are going to focus on the character of Savannah and her very problematic mom in the film. So Savannah is 33, single, and a successful television producer. She moved to Phoenix because according to her, the men in Denver were not it. And at the beginning of the movie, she narrates to the audience her attitude towards men and has come to the conclusion that what men are best at is convincing women that they should feel desperate. And this is a line to pay very close attention to. What men are best at is convincing women that we should feel desperate. And she says that she does not fall for that, but she does. She even refers to herself as desperate later on that evening. But as we watch her character arc, she does fall out of this state of desperation after her friend gives her a very different perspective on her relationship with a married man. So he left his wife in the end, right? <sighs> Take a wild guess, Savannah. So this married man, Kenneth, a man that apparently contacted Savannah's mom to get her number. And knowing that he's married, her mom is rooting for this to actually turn into a relationship. Savannah's mom preaches to her that every woman needs a man, apparently even if he's already taken. She's very much a piece of a man is better than no man type woman. So initially, against her own instincts, Savannah leans in, taking the advice of her mom, and reconnects with her now married past flame, Kenneth. And this man basically tries to string Savannah along as an out-of-state side piece. 
But Savannah does quickly come to her senses that this man is not going to leave his wife for her. And her mom, once she finds out that Savannah has broken ties with Kenneth, she is furious about this. Kenneth just called me and told me how simple you acted. He was actually crying. And men don't be crying over no woman unless they love them. So the pressure from Savannah's mom kind of comes from a good place. Albeit irrational and ill-informed, she just doesn't want her daughter ending up alone like her, which is why she pushes so hard for Savannah to pursue a married man. And I think many moms are well-meaning, although annoying on the subject of pushing marriage. Rose's mom, understanding that at that time, women don't have a lot of choices, she wants her daughter to marry well in terms of money. Of course it's unfair. We're women. Our choices are never easy. Savannah's mom doesn't want to see her daughter struggle like her. And this can be seen in many other films. In the movie Holiday, Sloane's mom has a similar outlook in pushing marriage as she doesn't want her daughter to quote unquote die alone in diapers. She also tries to get her to change her personhood through heavy criticism. No man wants a bitchy mother in law, so I guess that's three strikes. Tying this back to the excerpt that I read earlier, these mothers have a very hard time affirming their daughters and accepting the nouveau way in which they choose to live their lives and navigate relationships. And that's the common theme because they see them, their daughters, as extensions of themselves and they just simply want better for their offspring, even if they are steering them in a f***ed up direction. So what are your thoughts on the male-centered, marriage-minded mom? Please share your thoughts in the comments down below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more. Signing off now, your friend Dom.